grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is from our gospel reading, Mark 16, verse 6. And the angel said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Here is the reading of our text. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. Hallelujah! He is risen! He is risen indeed. Hallelujah! Well, pretty good. Let's try it again, though. Hallelujah! He is risen! He is risen indeed. Hallelujah! There we go. Yes, he is risen. And this is the most important thing that has happened in all of history. Easter is truly the day that changed history. It is the apex of our faith. It is the zenith of the work of Christ. It is so important that Paul can write to the Corinthians and say that if Christ had not been raised from the dead, we of all people are most to be pitied. That is because we would have been clinging to a false hope, a false victory. Like saying somebody won a race when they quit 10 feet away from the finish line. But Christ has been raised. So our hope is not in vain. It is secure. Our victory is in the history books. Hallelujah. It is actually a real joy to preach about Easter. I can't think of anything better to preach about than Easter. I can never understand these preachers that complain about all the work they have to do during Easter week. They get to preach an Easter sermon. You can't beat that. I remember talking to one preacher once, minister in a different denomination, let me tell you that. Um, he said he was always happy when Easter was over because he always ran out of stuff to preach about. I don't get that. I was stunned. How can you run out of stuff to preach about when your topic is the resurrection? There never is a time when we have preached or heard enough about the significance of Christ's resurrection. It is the linchpin that holds our faith together. It screams victory over sin, death, and the devil. Let me, this is a, a, an experiment right now to find out whether or not Easter is important for each and every individual right here. I would like to see a show of hands of everybody who believes that they are without sin. Everybody who believes that they're going to avoid the grave. Everybody here who thinks that they will not be tempted by their old Adam or the world or the devil or what have you. Show of hands, all. Well, then Easter means for you, victory. Because nobody raised their hand, and so you need Easter. Easter is your victory. Those who feel Easter is an unimportant part of our faith. Something that can be dispensed with, and we can stumble along with some sort of code of morals, like pulling it out of the Ten Commandments, or pulling it out of the Sermon on the Mount simply do not understand the Christian faith. It is not simply a collection of moralities and platitudes and feel-good ideas or whatever, or feel-bad ideas. So today, we will consider first a bit of what leads up to Easter, especially that which is in the spiritual realm. And then we will consider the meaning of Easter, especially what it means in the unseen spiritual realm. Because we all know the stories, right? We all have read, we've been through Passion Week, we've been to Palm Sunday, we've been to Monday, Thursday, we've been to Good Friday. We know what happened there from the point of view of our eyeballs. But there was so much more going on from the point of view of the spiritual realm. And Easter was so great, we know what happened there with our eyeballs. He rose from the dead. But there is so much more going on that our spiritual eyes need to see. So first, 
What led up to Easter was, as I was saying, Good Friday. On that day, the devil, the grave, sin, all false religion, all evil, all hatred, and anything else that desires to destroy humanity pulled out all their guns and they attacked the man who is Jesus Christ, true God and true man, who died for our sins and rose for our justification. They attacked and murdered the innocent Son of God, venting all their rage. But the resurrection declares that they won nothing in the battle. The devil and his, uh, his allies considered the history of God's people. And there have been some wonderful heroes of the faith, have there not? People like Isaiah, people like John the Baptist, people like Joseph, who took care of Jesus when he was a little guy, right? Or Moses. These are big guns, right? Big heroes of the faith. And the devil looked at him and says, I've attacked them. I've gotten them to stumble. I've gotten them to fall. I have beaten them. And death said, what happened to David? Gobbled him up. He's dead. What happened to Isaiah? Gobbled him up. Got him cut in two. Yeah, baby. What happened to John the Baptist? Death said, I got him. I had his head lopped off. No matter how holy they are, no matter how righteous they are, no matter how good they are, they are mine. Little tasty morsels to gobble up. And what is this Jesus? Just another prophet? Come on, devil, let's go get him. Let's tear him down. But here, death and the devil ran smack into a wall because Jesus cannot die. Because he's God. And God cannot die. Nor should he have, according to his human nature, died because he had no guilt. And therefore, death had no claim on him. You see, death has a claim on all humanity. On you, on me, on Moses, on Every person that you can think of, no matter how normal, no matter how noble, no matter how subnormal they may be, no matter how cute or ugly or whatever, sin has, death has a claim on them. Because, well, Paul puts it this way in Romans, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, that one man by Adam, and death comes because of Adam, so death passed to all men, for all have sinned. That doesn't mean all have sinned actively, although we have. It means we have all inherited the sin of Adam. We are born sinners. But death has no claim on Jesus because Jesus does not fulfill that requirement of that little clause that's in that phrase, for all have sinned. For Jesus did not sin. Death and the devil can't understand this. Jesus was born, right? There he is. He's a man. So he must have been born with inherited sin, right? He must have said, okay, we missed it. We didn't see it happen, but he had to have sinned. He's a man. How many sinless men do you know? How about sinless women? We don't exist, do we? And so, you know, using that sort of logic, death had come. And he had devoured countless people up to this point. And Jesus was just going to be another little snack. Jesus, on his part, didn't fight it. The innocent walked to the cross on behalf of the guilty. Death unjustly swallows him up and then ah, chokes. You ever eaten something you couldn't quite get down? <laughs> Well, that's what happened on that day. As Peter said in his Pentecost sermon, it was not possible for death to hold him. As our creeds confess, Jesus rose on the third day, on Easter. So what leads up to Easter is the attack of all of our ancient evil foes, turning their rage on Jesus. Jesus, for his part, did not resist. 
They brought out the big guns. He, like a lamb, went to the slaughter. It was the greatest act of injustice the world had ever seen. And you know, the world has seen a lot of injustice. It was the greatest act of pride, greed, malice, hatred, and so forth that the world has ever seen. And you know the world has seen a lot of pride and greed and malice and hate and so forth. But the attack was futile. Like waves crashing against the shore, trying to wear down the land. Like rain falling on the Rocky Mountains, trying to wash them to the sea. It just isn't going to happen. And Jesus overcame them. Like Paul wrote to the Romans, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That is just what Jesus did. He overcame our ancient evil foes with good. Easter day, Jesus rose. And I'm sure all of you have seen pictures of the resurrection, haven't you? But those pictures simply cannot do the event justice. What can't be seen by the natural human eye is Jesus disarming rulers and authorities and putting them to open shame by triumphing over them. Jesus Christ overcame them. He plundered them. He stripped our enemies. He humiliated them. This person, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, who lived on earth having all the characteristics of other men, was the one who snared death instead of the other way around. Death was swallowed up. The devil was so frightened. Him, he who scares people regularly, that's his job, you might say, to frighten people. He stood on Easter morning with his knees knocking and quaking. How could this be? We lost! But that is exactly what happened. Death and the devil were terrified. They knew now, finally, they had attacked the one whom they should never have attacked. Finally, the strength of the devil and death had been broken. Their backs had been broken. Those who were held prisoner were set free. Paul, citing Psalms, teaches us, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to man. When Jesus rose that Easter morning, the chains that bound humanity were more than broken, they vanished. And this is but the first gift to humanity that flows from Easter. Death sought to swallow up the eternal Lord. Like he had so many before, like, like a, a little, one of those little quiches. You know, you just pop a whole one in your mouth and, and he goes, oh, that tastes good, right? That's what he tried to do, but he got choked. He gagged. He could not get it down. It's like you found out that Keish had something really bad in it. <laughs> Instead of his greatest conquest, it became his greatest defeat. If a painter could capture the resurrection and what really happened, he would depict Jesus as the victor over death, the devil, hatred, suspicion, fear, envy, sickness, bigotry, depression, loneliness, sorrow, pain, false pride, doubt, disbelief, and all the other miseries that have come into this world because of the fall of mankind. He would also be freeing victims from the devil and death who had died in hope as they burst forth from their graves shouting, Hallelujah, praise God, Jesus is risen. You would see the church from all the ages, established by the resurrection, powered by the resurrection, bringing the victory of Jesus to every corner of our globe. The painter would somehow, somehow, and, and you know, this is why you need a guy who's artistically talented, because I would not be able to figure out how to do it, per se. But the painter would also, in that resurrection, get across that same idea that Martin Luther once said, said, my sin and death hung around Christ's neck on Good Friday, but on the day of Easter, they had completely disappeared. That is Easter. That is the resurrection of our Lord, and that is our victory. 
we esteem Jesus above all else. Because he is mighty, so must also be his resurrection. So must also be his victory that day. Christ is true God and true man. True son of the Father, born of the Virgin Mary, who is greater than heaven and earth. In addition, he is innocent and without sin. It's like Isaiah once said. He had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. And Peter echoes that same thought when he says he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. This sinless God-man is mightier than death, mightier than all the devils and death together. For Christ, true God and true man, is without guilt, without sin, and he is worth a thousand times more than all creation. And don't forget, the devil is just part of creation. When now we comprehend the greatness of the person, we recognize the greatness of the fruit. Compared to Jesus, sin, death, and the devil are puny. They're weaklings. They're wimps. They're weak. They're beggarly. They are impotent. As mighty as the suffering of Jesus was, the might of the resurrection was greater. He literally overwhelmed all our foes that day. The resurrection is so powerful that it reaches forward and backwards in time. When we were baptized, we were baptized into his victory. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are partaking of his victory, his resurrection. When we hear the words of absolution, we are bathed in resurrection power. When we read the Holy Word, we are shaped by the resurrection of Christ. On the last day, we will be raised to eternal glory by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is why what Paul means when he says that, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He is the first fruits, the first one to rise and never die again. We are the rest of the crops. And we will be raised to never die again on that last day. Now, it is fashionable today. In fact, it has been fashionable for a long, long, long time. This is something that always seems trendy and is just about as old as the fall. <clears throat> and uh, it is to hold that the heart of Christianity can be found in its moral guidelines. So, for example, Thomas Jefferson liked things like the Sermon on the Mount, but he rejected things like the resurrection. When I was young, and perhaps people still say this, but when I was young, uh, people used to say, even if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, I would still be a Christian. It makes my life so much better. Doesn't that sound pious and warm and fuzzy? That is so stupid. Tell it. Tell it to the 100 plus Christians in Kenya that were martyred this past week. If Christ had not been raised, their death would have been in vain. But Christ has been raised. So they will be raised on the last day to eternal glory. They will join the thief on the cross with Jesus in paradise. And on the last day, those murderers that killed them will face eternal condemnation and shame. That is what the resurrection means. That when somebody pops into the room with a gun and says, all Christians stand, I want to shoot you, the Christians can stand because they know that is not the end. Jesus will raise them to new life. Even Good Friday, as wondrous and mighty as it is, is a defeat without Easter. The resurrection of Jesus turns Good Friday into the victory that God intends it to be, the victory that it is. So did Easter change 
history? Yes. Yes, a thousand times yes. Only to say it changed history is something of an understatement. It is an earthquake in history, changing the landscape of everything, changing our present, changing our past, changing our future. Easter is the almighty power of God touching us with forgiveness and life and hope and purpose and victory and all the wonderful gifts that God gives. Because of this, we say, with Christians from around the world and throughout the time, hallelujah, he is risen. Let's try that again. Hallelujah, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. May the peace of God which passes human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. <laughs>